There's not a single animal in the world whose death is so colossal that it literally has its own name. A whale fall. And you might think all that happens is these creatures just fall to the bottom of the abyss, never to be seen again. But what actually happens is the equivalent of a meteor strike for all marine life. A meteor made of meat. When whales die, they don't really just die. They go through stages, with each one lasting multiple days to months before the whale is truly gone. These events are so monumental that entire species are fully reliant on whale falls to occur, and would go completely extinct if these events were to suddenly stop. But to understand how this even happens, we first have to look at how giant whales even die in the first place. These are quite literally the thickest animals in the world, so large that they have no real predators. Well, besides one. But without many things to eat them first, most whales die the same way ancient giants do. Slowly, from old age, disease, or exhaustion. And this might just be the most brutal death in the entire ocean. Whales are mammals, which means unlike fish, they have to surface to breathe air. Every few minutes, even the largest of them have to push their multi-ton bodies all the way up from the deep just to take a single breath. And when you weigh over 100,000 pounds, that's not exactly easy. When they're young whales, it's almost nothing. They rocket upwards with the strength of a freight train and can dive up and out of the water easily. But as they age, that same journey becomes torture. Their muscles weaken, their fat stores shift, and the effort it takes to fight gravity and pressure just to reach the surface can be extremely difficult, and eventually impossible. When they become too old and too weak, their bodies are simply too heavy for their strength to hold up. It's cruel and almost ironic that the very weight that once made them untouchable behemoths is what ends up killing them. But as the saying goes, what the sea giveth, the sea taketh away. Or something like that. Regardless, when this happens, this is the beginning of what we call a whale fall. But oddly enough, the actual fall doesn't start just yet. The whale actually enters its first stage, the floating stage. And as you might expect, during the floating stage, the whale's massive body floats. See, when a whale dies, the gases inside its body turn it into a giant bloated island of flesh. It can stay buoyant like this for days, even weeks, as it slowly moves across the ocean surface. But I already know what you're thinking. If they're floating, how did they ever die from drowning before? When a whale's alive, it isn't naturally buoyant. It's dense, all muscle, bone, and blubber, and it has to constantly swim to stay near the surface. But when it dies, bacteria inside the body starts breaking down tissue, releasing gases like methane, carbon dioxide, hydrogen sulfide, and this literally inflates the carcass from the inside out like a giant disgusting balloon. It's not something they could really turn on while they were alive. And while it's floating, the first stage of brutality begins. Sharks, seabirds, and even other whales start tearing into it while it drifts, ripping out chunks of blubber and meat that can feed entire food chains. But eventually, this big old meat balloon starts to deflate. All the gases leak out and the whale's body loses buoyancy. The ocean slowly begins to reclaim it. Piece by piece, the carcass suddenly starts to sink, which brings you to the whale fall itself, when the whale reaches the bottom of the ocean. This actually takes a while, usually multiple hours, but it depends on the size of the whale and the depth of the ocean. If the ocean is around 3,000 meters deep when it dies, and it falls at about 30 meters per minute, it would take approximately an hour and 40 minutes to reach the bottom. Imagine you're a deep sea fish swimming by and you see the largest mass you've ever seen just slowly crashing towards the bottom. But when it finally touches the seafloor is when the third stage begins, the scavenger stage. Unfortunately, this is one of the most nasty stages, but I guess you could see it as beautiful depending on how you look at it. Within hours, all the deep sea scavenger animals arrive. Hagfish, sleeper sharks, crabs, amphipods, all tearing into the whale. These scavengers can strip hundreds of pounds of flesh in a single day, and over the next few months to years, they'll consume up to 90% of the whale's biomass. What's left behind are bones, connective tissue, and oily residue seeping into the surrounding sediment. As you know, the deep sea is not exactly known for having an abundance of food, so coming across something like this is like winning the lottery for deep sea animals. A big, meaty lottery. What's left behind after the massacre starts the next stage, the enrichment opportunist stage. 
Worms, crustaceans, and bacterial mats will now thrive on what the large scavengers left behind. They burrow into the sediment around the bones, feeding on the oily residue and decaying tissue embedded deep in the seafloor. I know this sounds disgusting, but that's because it is. If this was at the surface, it would smell absolutely horrific. Thousands of pounds of rotting meat, decomposing fats, and sulfur and ammonia filling the air from bacterial activity, which is the classic rotten egg stench, mixed with a fishy decay. This stage lasts for years, sometimes decades, as the whale's remains slowly transform the surrounding environment. What was once a single carcass becomes an entire ecosystem and is now a thriving, living island in the middle of an otherwise empty abyss. Some of the creatures that appear on these sunken whale piles are so specialized they can't survive anywhere else. The most famous are the bone-eating worms, known as Osidax. They don't have mouths or stomachs and instead use root-like tendiffs filled with bacteria to digest the fats inside the bones themselves. Alongside them are strange clams, mussels, and amphipods that feed on the chemical soup leaking from the whale's remains. Many of these species are found only on whale falls, entire life forms that owe their existence to the death of something far larger. And just when it seems like there's nothing left to take from this poor whale, life finds one more way to feed off it. That's when the final feeding stage begins. At this point, the whale's flesh is long gone, and only the bones remain. But those bones are loaded with lipids, and deep sea bacteria know exactly how to turn that into life. Specialized microbes start breaking down the fats inside the bones, releasing hydrogen sulfide, a gas that's toxic to most animals, but fuel to whatever monsters the deep sea has created. Giant tube worms, mussels, and clams appear, living off the bacteria that feed on the whale's bones. It's basically a miniature hypothermal vent ecosystem, except this time it's not powered by magma or sunlight, just the absolutely giant corpse of a whale. This stage can last decades to even a century. A whale that died over a hundred years ago can still be sustaining new life, essentially turning one big animal into thousands of smaller ones. So this is kind of beautiful, but also wildly disgusting. I'm not really sure how to feel about this, but I guess it's just life in the ocean? But what comes after this stage? Well, even with the whale's massive size, eventually even bones give out. The sulfides run dry, the bacteria die off, and what's left of the whale is nothing more than a brittle skeleton, cleaned, hollow, and settled deep into the sediment. But this isn't fully the end. Over time, corals, sponges, and anemones begin to attach themselves to the remaining bone structures, turning the once rotting carcass into a kind of deep sea reef. Tiny fish and invertebrates move in, hiding among the ribs and vertebrae like its ancient architecture. They're no longer feeding on the whale, but using its body one last time for literal structural support, literally turning into a reef. Eventually, even this might end until all the whale's atoms are dispersed completely, but it can last nearly a century. And this is how most whale falls occur. They follow along this exact process until there's nothing left but atoms throughout the ocean. But how often are these ecosystem creating events even happening? Well, interestingly, whale falls were actually increasingly common for a short period of time. During the height of industrial whaling in the 19th and 20th centuries, thousands of whales were killed each year, and many of their carcasses or body parts were dumped back into the ocean after being stripped for oil and blubber. Every one of those deaths, natural or not, sends a ripple through the ocean. A single whale fall can sustain an entire ecosystem for decades, so every lost whale is both a tragedy and a gift to the deep sea. These whalers were essentially throwing an ecosystem to the bottom of the sea. In a twisted way, the whaling industry fed life in the deep sea even as it devastated it at the surface. But obviously, this can only happen for so long. When more whales die, there's less to create more whales. Eventually, some whales were driven towards near extinction, and their populations are still low today. A massive surge in whale falls creates a massive surge in life down below. But then, when there's suddenly a massive decrease in whale falls, all that life now has nothing to eat. As you might have guessed, dropping entire ecosystems can really mess up the balance of the ocean. But what other things can cause a whale fall? Well, along with whalers, whale falls can also come from ship collisions, killer whales, or stranding events where the carcass eventually drifts back out to sea. It's pretty brutal, but a ship accidentally ramming into a whale near the surface
surface can kill it instantly. Even though whales are hundreds of thousands of pounds, ships are tens of millions of pounds. The steel hull ramming into a whale is definitely enough to kill one, causing unintentional whale falls. Killer whales also play a part, and in packs they are capable of taking down adult whales, but often target calves instead. But as part of the natural cycle of nature, they aren't really a threat for whale extinction. Beaching events, oddly enough, can also cause whale falls as well. It's pretty counterintuitive since he wouldn't think a beach whale would sink since it's, well, on land. But when whales get stranded on land, whether it's because they're sick, disorientated by sonar, or following another whale too close to shore, they get stuck. Their own weight crushes their organs and the sun begins to cook the body from the outside in. As the body decomposes, gases build up inside, inflating the whale like normal but on land. If the whale is stranded near the waterline or during a rising tide, the trapped gas can eventually make it buoyant again, and then it gets brought back out to sea into the whale full process again. Oddly enough, this is how the exploding whale events happen. If the carcass isn't moved quickly, gases start to build up and the pressure keeps rising until the skin stretches is tight like a balloon and eventually bursts. That's where you get those infamous stories of whales suddenly combusting where all the trapped methane, sulfur, and decay fluids suddenly blast outwards. In the end, it doesn't really matter how the whale dies. Any large whale that dies and sinks becomes just another instant ecosystem for the abyss. We don't really know how many whales are actually down there as new ecosystems because there's just way too much of the ocean floor to explore to find each one. It could be hundreds or thousands, but based on the amount of whales that die each year, it's likely that the abyss is dotted with these done-for-you cities. Ironically, the most lively places in the bottom of the ocean is the exact places where something died. Whether this is beautiful, disgusting, or both, no creature on this planet besides the whale has such a large impact after death. Thank you guys for watching. We've just hit 30,000 subscribers, so I really can't thank you enough for supporting the Beyond the Blue channel. I'm working hard to make sure I'm delivering on what you guys want to see, so if you had any more ideas, just leave it in the comments below. And if you want to see a video about how the two largest squids in the world evolved, check it out here.